Okay, so it's uh, 3 p.m. Well, at least over here in Finland, a bit less elsewhere maybe, at least for our panelists. And uh, it's it's time for, for today's webinar on building AI-driven products, uh, having learnings both from uh, H&M and Aura is, uh, is uh, today's topic. So welcome, welcome everyone coming over here and listening to the panel discussion. Uh, so we'll be going going through a bit of more more detail for, for our guest panelists as well. Uh, first, getting started. So I'm Nico Vokom, uh, working as CTO at uh, Silo AI, and today with me we have Madeleine Moritz from uh, HMM, and then uh, Shentin Odal Savik from Ura. I hope the name went approximately right this time. So welcome both uh, both of our panelists. Definitely. And we'll be hearing more about them quite shortly. So uh, we'll be running the next hour uh, of the webinar in the following way, where each panelist will first give an overview, overview of their background, experience, role at the, at the company, and also the, the overall thinking on, on the topic of the day, how they're seeing things from, from their uh, side of the world. Uh, next, we'll dive in to a uh, panel discussion itself, touching on, on various dimensions on, on how to succeed in linking both the business and technology side when building AI-driven products, finding the challenges there and uh, how to hopefully proactively tackle them uh, front already. And then at the end, finally, we'll have time for audience uh, Q&A. So please uh, keep on posting the questions on the right-hand side of the screen. So, so you can uh, start putting them there already now, and, and then we'll pick, the, pick what we have time for at, at the end. Also, also uh, along with the Q&A, there's a small poll you'll probably find from there as well. And hopefully you can answer that. And, We'll check uh, what the results will be there. But anyway, to, to get started overall with today's agenda, so uh, Madeleine, uh, maybe can you maybe get started and give a few words about yourself and uh, your work at uh, HMM and how, how you see the topic of today's webinar in general? Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and talking about this super interesting topic. I'm hoping that I have something to contribute with in, in this discussion. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I got some feedback that my internet maybe isn't optimal. So if I freeze, um, then you'll just have to live with, with a frozen image of me for a while, I guess. But please let me know if you can't hear me and then... Ah. We'll, we'll try to solve that. But uh, I um, my name is Madeleine Moritz and I work as a product owner within business tech organization at H&M. And first, I want to give you some background or context about H&M. And uh, maybe some of you have heard. H&M um, is a Swedish retail company uh, and we're uh, kind of driven by the desire to make great designs available to everyone. Uh, and it's a huge organization. So we have almost 5,000 stores in 77 markets and e-commerce presence in 57 markets, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so you can imagine it's a huge organization and there are probably like a million different decisions being made every day throughout the whole company. So it's uh, how much should we produce of a certain garment? How, how much quantity is needed per store to meet the customer demand? What price should we set? What uh, are the customers interested in show, seeing on the site, for example? So being such a huge organization, these same decisions are being made by sometimes like hundreds of different people on a daily basis. And they often have quite limited decision-making support. Uh, and also you can imagine that we have quite a lot of data in the organization because we have so much processes and so many people doing things. And um, so, so we have a lot of data. Uh, so there's definitely huge potential in utilizing this uh, data in like smarter decision making to increase both profit and also be more uh, sustainable. Uh, so not to overproduce and to limit waste, uh, something that we as a company have, have realized. 
Uh, and then I want to mention that my background is mainly from, from the business side. So uh, I started my H&M journey as a business controller. And it's a lot about like analyzing data and acting fast. And you had to do that with quite limited, as I said, like quite limited amount of uh, decision making support. So it was very much like gut feeling and, and things like that. So we want to kind of... Uh, or the idea, what I wanted to do is to uh, be closer to tech and development and really be able to make like a bigger impact and improve how we did things from kind of an earlier stage. Uh, so that's kind of where or how I ended up where I am today. And I think also my background in this discussion, I've been kind of on the receiving end of technology quite a lot so starting out like getting a lot of uh, a lot of uh, new tools and new support systems uh, and i think that has kind of helped me in the role as product owner i think i understand a bit about the frustrations and needs in the business to quite a large extent which really helps uh, but then uh, this this shifts of course all the time so so you need to to stay up to date on that too but going into my uh, product mission then, it's to optimize prices to match customer demand while maximizing selling and also uh, profitability. So the solution that we have built is based on machine learning and data. And I've been involved from like idea stage to uh, kind of rolling out or EB testing the solution and rolling out. And we also worth mentioning is that we work in cross-functional teams, meaning we have all necessary expertise within the team to execute on uh, the roadmap and the priorities that we set. And um, so I'm very like happy having this cross-functional team because everyone is kind of experienced in, in certain parts that is needed to kind of fulfill the, uh, our scope. So um, summing up then, uh, my background being mainly from business, I think my perspective in this discussion will be more towards like business alignment, stakeholder. And I would say that my experience is quite practical or hands-on, maybe rather than like theoretical or uh, mirroring maybe a company-wide AI strategy, uh, which might be good just to add. And I think also worth mentioning here in the beginning is that I'm one product owner for one use case at H&M and there are a lot of product owners optimizing different parts of, uh, of our value chain and they might come from completely different backgrounds. So I just want to say that. So today I'm here speaking for uh, myself and from my experiences and by saying this, I'm hoping that I kind of free myself from any type of accountability that, <laughs> that it might come to. Uh, but but yeah, so really happy to be here. I hope I, I covered that in under five minutes. Okay, sounds good. So how about uh, Shetil? Let's uh, maybe have the same from your side. So a bit of yourself, your work at Ura and uh, the topic of today. Yeah, I also want to free myself from any and all accountability for anything I say today. So just to get that out of the way right away. But yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, <laughs> it's good to get out of the way. So yeah, anyway, I'm Kjetil. I'm a data science manager at Oda, where I've worked for three and a half years now. And my background is actually in economics and business administration. But I've exclusively worked with engineering and technology and data since I began my adult career eight years ago. Um, and I guess you can say I've been a data scientist more or less the entire time. Um, before I was at Oda, I spent a few years in consulting, um, but I was also uh, part of building up a data science team in the biggest electronics retailer in the Nordics uh, before I finally find, found my home, uh, I hope, for some time at Oda. And uh, what I've learned is that I'm motivated to work on mostly anything that's within the AI and data science space. It doesn't matter if I'm making slides or models. Uh, as long as I'm like kind of furthering the company's AI goals. Uh, I'm telling you this as a warning <laughs> that my inputs to the discussion later will probably be all over the place uh, because I've done a lot of different things. Uh, but yeah, what does Oda do? We do online groceries, um, but we self-identify more as a tech and logistics company. And uh, we own the entire, uh, for, uh, like the entire value chain all the way from the fulfillment center to the product show up at the customer's uh, doorsteps and the entire customer experience around it. And we're the biggest in online groceries in Norway and the most affordable commercial force me to say that. And we also recently launched in Finland 
and we will soon be launching in Germany. And then suddenly, I guess there is quite a few people from Finland here. Uh, you may have seen the trucks riding around. Uh, um, riding around. Um, and the fact that we own the entire value chain means that there is a lot of potential for AI. Like all the from the classic, like um, make this process a bit better with AI to the more transformative. Can we just automate all the shopping for the customers with AI? Maybe. Um, I've been a hands-on data scientist for most of my time in the company um, and manager for some of the data scientists. I've been involved in many of our data science projects, ranging from product recommendations to forecasting, uh, and also spent a significant amount of time in the MLOps area, building capabilities, um, so that data scientists can be happy and productive. Um, and speaking of data scientists, there are 27 of us in Ola, and most of them work in cross-functional teams that are responsible for different parts of the customer experience or the logistics. Um, and I was data scientist number three in the company. Um, um, and at the time, we were maybe 20, 25 people in product and technology. And now we're at least 10 times that, like uh, three years later. So it's been quite a journey. And I hope to share like a few of our learnings with you today. It'll be fun. Um, and one of the things that I'm particularly passionate about is understanding how a company can work more systematically towards the more transformative AI capabilities, which is the place I've kind of spent most of my time the last year. Um, so like the one the things, uh, the capabilities that like make you take a step back and, uh, look at how you can rethink your entire product and service and organization, um, uh, now that you have this AI that you can take advantage of. And right now this doesn't seem very pressing for many companies, I think. Um, but these types of AI capabilities, they kind of live in the long term and they have the potential to, I think they have the potential to give you like almost an assailable competitive advantages due to this flywheel effect of data feedback loops that you can build. Like if your product is truly intelligent and learning and learning at the pace <laughs> that your competitors can't catch up to, that's a very powerful competitive advantage. Um, so like, for example, how relevant is the manually driven car when somebody cracks the code for self-driving in an affordable way because they've done tons of upfront investments in painstaking data collection, extremely difficult engineering tasks. How do you catch up to that? Or closer to home, how relevant is your online grocery store when someone just figures out how to give people the food they want at the right time with absolutely minimal effort involved? Again, because they built an intelligent product. Or how relevant is the clothing store, be it online or physical, when algorithms just understand what you want and ship it home to you? Probably some relevance, but it's worth uh, thinking about. And um, I think many companies are like iterating around in some local optima, trying to put some AI here, some AI there probably making some things better, probably making some things worse as well along the way. I believe there is a better way, and I don't claim to have all the answers, neither me or Ola, but I have been working for some time raising awareness about this in the company um, and come up with what we call an AI-first strategy for AI-first product development, uh, together with a few of my colleagues, which we're now starting to implement. So I do my best to squeeze some of these things into the discussion later. Um, I should also say I'm completely clueless about clothes and fashion, although I am wearing an HM shirt today. Um, uh, although one of, one of the companies that I admire the most for their data science approach is Stitch Fix, which is an online styling service. So if you're familiar with the way that data science is core at Stitch Fix, you may recognize some of their thought leadership from my contributions to the discussion. So that was a good opportunity to both give credit where credit is due <laughs> and recommend something you can check out after the webinar. Like they share liberally about these things. So yeah, I guess that's me. Okay, sounds good. All right. So maybe still a bit, bit, bit from, from my side and uh, about silo as well. So, so briefly about myself, I, I think consider, compared to chat you, so I've, I've been sort of taking the other way with the rounds. So, so starting from technology, machine learning, PhD originally, and then, then moving to the business side and sort of in, in the same manner co covering uh, things that are in between of things. So, so I've been working both with the big coach, big companies like Nokia and Sunvik and so on, but also like startups ranging from drones and mobile apps uh, to mobility and, and, and so on. And, and really from the technical start, then for more later moved on to working in product management and then afterwards also in business development. So it's sort of a combination of that. And, uh, and I, I think really, uh, Pretty often the, the big question is, is really that I think uh, looking at the software field of things, then product management has become pretty efficient in, in how do you think about software? How do you improve software? How do you organize people around all of these topics? 
But then it remains a big question of, well, how do the, all of these things change when it's, it's no more about software as such, where, where you go and decide the logic and implement it as such, but it, things become machine learning related, where you decide on what you want to do, and then you try to figure out where's the data, and then you just hope that, that uh, the data will somehow turn in, into those features you were looking for later on uh, over there. Uh, perhaps briefly on, on silo still, I, I would assume that many of, of attendees are already quite familiar with us, uh, at least hopefully, uh, but, but more or less since early days, we've always seen the biggest value in AI, not so much in, in improving uh, internal processes and, and doing analytics with machine learning, but rather building machine learning as, as part of the products and services we use uh, every single day and, and seeing the biggest value there. So we, we started from Finland uh, just five years ago. So, so I think we're, we're the smallest party here present today, uh, but still now present in Finland, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, we've always had a lot of international customers as, as well and uh, worked with them in, in designing, implementing and running uh, AI-driven products and services. So. Right now, around 240 people and one of the biggest AI-focused AI services companies in, in Europe. So building AI for product R&D has always been uh, silo core focus and, uh, and putting, putting that AI into product R&D, whether it's cars, smart devices, factory floors, consumer applications, healthcare treatments, logistics experiences, and, and all, the, all the other things uh, related. And, uh, I think the big learnings have often been there overall about not so much that all the little technical things you need to get right to have the overall solution running, but also all the non-technical things about training people, getting them on board on the change, building new mindsets on how to think about the new technology and, and being innovative about it. Uh, how to be efficient and in maintaining things and, and doing pro better process around, processes around that and, 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 and so on. So, so I think that's, that's the point from, from where we're coming at uh, on the topic here. But moving, more, moving a bit, let, let's say, more to the discussion side overall. So uh, thinking about HMM uh, overall, Madeleine, so, so that's, of course, uh, like... A, really, really big company. And uh, as you said, uh, you're one of the many who are trying to, to uh, figure out the path from ideas all the way to the new features that are actually then touched by, by the real, real users, uh, customers you have. But well, what's, what's your like, how do you see, what are the big building blocks? Uh, how, how do you see this process from uh, an idea to the real users there? And, uh, Maybe specifically, like, do you see any differences in the process because it's uh, just because there's machine learning involved? Like, how and why is it different versus doing the same things in the regular software? Good question. I think, um, I mean, I don't think there is a particularly big um, like difference when we uh, first start up because I think what we realize is, th is that we need to really start uh, with the problem like truly understanding the problem in order to plan what kind of solution makes sense so uh, I think for us we we kind of start with understanding the problem and this can be like much more difficult than it sounds. Like it sounds really easy. Like, ah, oh, the problem is we need uh, a demand forecast to predict uh, selling. But then you kind of need to be the difficult person who asks like, okay, but why do we need a demand forecast? Because a demand forecast in itself isn't solving any issues, right? Um, and then it could be like, oh, we need to, we want to predict what we will sell uh, next week. Okay, but why Why do we need to predict what to sell next week? So it's kind of really getting to the bottom of, of the problem as a, as a start. And you could realize that really like the issue isn't necessarily, uh, or the best solution isn't necessarily an AI. It could be like a rule-based solution, or maybe there's something on the market that is better for us to buy in or, or 
instead of building it ourselves. So I think that's where we start with any type of kind of development. Uh, so understanding the problem, I would say, and then uh, of course, like finding the right data. So this can be quite tricky when it's a big company and uh, and like we have a lot of data. Uh, so making sure that we find the data, we need to explore and clean the data before we can sort of use it and see if we can uh, catch any patterns or, or things to work with. Um, and then I would say the biggest difference when it comes to another, uh, like a, not an AI uh, sort of problem, would of course be the, the talent or the, the people that we need, like the skill sets might be a bit different. Um, and of course, like when we start modeling, we need to understand the, what, like what type of model would suit this problem um, and then evaluate that and try to automate it and, and scale it as soon as, as possible. Um, so I think that's like high level uh, how, we, how we look at it. Um, but I think and we've, I mean, when we started up my product, we had a lot of discussion about the problem and what we wanted to achieve. And it's actually something that we've been trying to achieve before, but we haven't really uh, succeeded with um, prior. Uh, and I will, I can go into that later on. But um, yeah, so I think that's yeah. uh, for, forcing us to think about the why for a really long time, which can be frustrating because we really want to have a solution ready uh, tomorrow. But yeah, yeah. Actually, when you mentioned this, this that it it can be a lot of like different approaches. Like it doesn't have to be the most complex ever deep learning algorithm that that solves the problem but it can be something like really simple and and, and then there's always also like uh, people have uh, also interests in, in you know trying new things or maybe just trying things that are familiar to them and and then it's I guess there's this challenge of how do you keep the discussion focused on what actually matters that it's it's not about the what technology we choose but how do we best solve the real problem at, at hand like uh, do, do you often need to sort of try to then push the discussion back back to this what what really matters or, or do you have like some sort of good good tactic how, how to do that a good, a very, uh, very good question. I wish I had something really clearly, but I think just uh, just spending enough time on it usually works and uh, trying to kind of uh, ask why, why, why until we reach kind of the bottom and then we, we've kind of identified what is the main issue that we want to solve. And then we can look at like what potential uh, solutions could we have. Uh, to that, and I, I agree with you that we, I mean, H and M has come quite a long way, I would say, uh, when it comes to AI and kind of uh, we're, we've been working or investing a lot in in trying to improve like AI literacy in the in the company, and everyone should understand and kind of know what what the benefits are. But with that comes also, I think, uh, like as you say, like stakeholders and business uh, people are really interested in AI and it, it sounds really cool and you kind of want to apply AI to every problem, uh, but maybe it doesn't always make sense. So it's kind of a, it has pros and cons uh, with, with spreading that, that knowledge, mostly cons, of course, or mostly pros, sorry, most cons. But this would be the only con that we kind of want to apply AI wherever, wherever we can. How do you see shed yourself this this sort of pipeline from from ideas to users? You're actually at least at least for now you're still a bit of a smaller company. So so, so uh, consider also your past in bigger companies. Is is there actually benefits? You know, in, in sort of having a more lean process there, or uh, what's yeah. the approach? I, uh, I I completely support like the what what Madeline says. It's a, all about like uh, and I don't want like reiterate on that. It's, it's kind of yeah, there's a lot about understanding the business slash customer problem. I I think it also there's there's some there's a devils devils in the details here. So um, and like what is the scope that you're working? on in terms of like the problem definition like when you think about ai what does ai do ai automates cognitive tasks it thinks so that you don't have to think or it does really sophisticated input output mapping is <laughs> also another way to say it performs inference it makes predictions so 
if you're dealing with problems that has to do with automating cognition, then making predictions is potentially a good solution to that problem. And it's not that necessarily you are able to make the right predictions right away and make a killer AI solution. But if you recognize that the problem you're working with is basically making predictions about some outcome that so, so that somebody doesn't have to think about it, then kind of like the, the peak solution for that, the theoretically optimal one, it's probably going to be an AI solution, right? And then you, if you start planning for that in the start, like when you design the product, right? Building feedback loops, et cetera, in order to make the algorithm better. I think that's... Um, I completely agree that you need to focus on understanding the problem, but the level at which you understand the problem, the level of ex abstraction that you have the mandate to operate on, right, is very is very important. So for all the sake, I mean, like we are solving one giant prediction problem. Like what food do you need and when do you need it? And we can break that down, right? And we are to, to like the problem that according to our customer research, the problem that we are like uh, really need to solve is planning. Because in Norway, people don't plan their groceries. They just go to the store every day, more or less. That's the common pattern. And planning is a cognitive task. And AI automates cognition. So on like the overall level, I think there's a very good like uh, market to technology mapping here. I think that's a good way to approach this problem problem understanding uh, mm. part. Yeah. yeah. How, how much is, is it actually since, for example, for for us, uh, it's, it's it's sometimes we, we we head into situations where customer has, has a dream of a of certain capability uh, for, for their product. And and then it's a question, well, is, is this actually feasible? Can you actually implement this? Whether in, in real terms that this is just not possible with current technology, or alternatively that there's just a very worry, very long gap between the type of data you have and the type of data you would need. And then we need to sort of start doing this sort of backtracking, uh, help, helping them to sort of backtrack their thinking. In what were, what were they originally thinking? What were they originally trying to achieve? And, uh, and, and then then get to the bottom of things and then start solving again like this the underlying problem of what what was to be achieved but for, for both i guess like do you how often do you actually end up uh trying to figure out the feasibility of of the problem itself and and also in a way because with, with machine learning it's always a challenge that you don't exactly know can you actually implement things before you you see and, and try things out? So so there's a bit of risk, additional risk versus traditional software. So do you have any like specific way to to handle that uncertainty that you might actually have to reconsider later on? Madeline, you want to go? I was thinking you could uh, start <laughs> this time, Shelby. Okay. Sure, I have a ton of notes on this point. So that's good. Ah, <laughs> I think like that like Nico is pointing to, like the thing with AI is that you don't always know until you've tried it. So you need some product development approach that kind of accounts for this. Like your roadmap and your plans need to account for AI exploration and experimentation, right? So if you want to work in like an AI first kind of way where you use AI where it's appropriate, then you probably need to focus less on features you want to build and more on hypotheses you want to explore or predictions you want to make. And then think about how we can build your product on top of that. Um, so, but you do need to need some idea of the feasibility before like going, going, going ahead. So what we're starting to do now at Oda is thinking about AI initiatives in terms of their viability, desirability and feasibility. Just keep in mind that this is, may, I'm not sure how well this generalizes to another company. I've only been doing this in Oda, so take it with a grain of salt. But uh, let's, uh, let's, let's try it. So, so you can first look at like the viability. What's, what's the monetary potential of an initiative? We should map to some outcome that people want. People care about outcomes. People are willing to, to pay for outcomes, right? And um, let's take, for example, we're, we're looking at an AI initiative uh, related to, to dinners, for example, which is, uh, I mean, know that like most people want to have dinner. <laughs> at least the vast majority of us do. And uh, dinner products are maybe 30% maybe of the shopping basket, something like that. Um, and we, all, we know something about our market share in this category and how much market share we could potentially have. 
Um, the idea is not to like have some formula or be super precise, just to, it should be useful for asking the right questions and comparing alternatives. Like here, it's quite clear that there's monetary potential in solving dinners more than so than children's birthday parties, which is a more rare occasion, right? And then we want to look at the desirability. How, does, how useful is it to solve the task with AI? Like since we already talked about like AI automatic cognition, is this a, is this a cognitive task? Is it an undesirable cognitive task? According to our customer research, planning dinners for our customers is a very hard cognitive task. Uh, it's also kind of an undesirable cognitive task, depending on who you ask. And it does so that means that it does make sense to consider AI in this situation. And we also need to think about in this point, like what are the inputs to this cognitive process? You need to try to understand like how people think about stuff if you want to automate cognition. <laughs> And then only then do we get to the feasibility, um, which uh, I would say, like, how difficult is the problem to solve with AI? How hard is it to make the predictions that you need to make? And this is closely related to, as Nico alluded to, both the availability of data and the complexity of the problem, but not necessarily just the data you have, like how hard it is to get the data that you need. <laughs> and this, this is why it's so important to think about this, because if you're only using the data, if you're only collecting data and using like exhaust data, to make AI and predictions, you're just you're always one step behind. You're not thinking like ahead. What data do you need to collect in order to make to make um, to make great AI, right? So if you um, so yeah, when speaking about dinners, Norwegians on average have ten dinners in circulation, <laughs> and we don't need that many orders placed at Oda to reveal these preferences. So it shouldn't be extremely difficult to make uh, some useful dinner predictions for the majority of people. So now that you have these things, then you can start thinking about like, okay, what AI initiatives should be prioritized first and second, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But now the real work starts because now you need to iterate and learn. <laughs> you need to continuously update your beliefs about the feasibility and the desirability as you, as you go along. Okay. Any, any thoughts, Madeline, here? Um... No, I, I mean, I think it makes uh, a lot of sense and I, I recognize these types of, of discussions. We were, I mean, when starting up my product, we were quite lucky because we already uh, were really clear on, we had a really clear business case. We had a really clear kind of, we, we already have an, an existing AI use case that has proven to be very valuable in kind of the same area. So I think that saved us a lot of time when just going into kind of a uh, solution mode uh, after uh, identifying the problem a bit but so I think uh, I mean if if we would start again with a completely new problem I think this uh, this approach makes uh, makes full sense yeah yeah but then then I, I actually um, uh, thinking about the feasibility aspects because it's it's one thing to think about this let's say technical feasibility like like can someone actually make this work but but then it's it's the other way to think about it is, can, can we as an organization, can we as a, as a group of people make this work? And, and then you get to this emotional and uh, psychological thing. And I think you've, you've already gone through a pretty long path over there uh, at, at HMM in terms of this sort of psychological safety, that there's some people who are afraid and some who are really excited about new technology, then there's decision makers who, who need to balance this this problem that 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 they are expected to invest in, in a new type of technology and, and see their sort of show their visionary side uh, in that way. But at the same time, it's always a risk to try new technology and what happens to the, to to them and their reputation if everything goes wrong uh, on, on the way there. So, so there's a lot of these sort of emotional things related there. Uh, and like, how, how do you get people to just focus and, and be comfortable in, in working here? Like, and has there been any sort of like, what, what do you see the big success or learnings there at HMM? Definitely. Um, I'm very happy about this question because here, I think we, we've gathered a lot of reflections and, and thoughts in this area, but um, I mean, we, we often talk internally about like AI as amplified intelligence. Uh, so we see like the greatest opportunity in combining human and artificial intelligence. 
Um, but uh, and I think that's good for like speaking with stakeholders because obviously if you're a business uh, working in the business and someone comes up to you and says oh we're going to automate this entire process so basically you're not needed anymore or your expertise is not as important anymore of course that can uh, result in in uh, a bit of psychological um in no, no, like not not safety at least um so it's not always like an easy sell and and my my product when uh, before i uh, started uh, in this context we uh, there was other attempts at, at trying to solve this uh, exact kind of business problem and when we started up we obviously wanted to look into this in detail and understand like why didn't it succeed because uh, we we saw that maybe the like the solution itself wasn't bad uh, it for some reason we just didn't continue with it so we tried to understand like why it was unsuccessful and we boiled it down to kind of two main areas so the first one was a bit of lack of transparency uh, and the other one was uh, like unclear success criteria and if we dig into these two like uh, i think it's uh, or when we talk about these like quite complex machine learning models it is super important to try to be as transparent as we possibly can with how the model works and i mean if if you work in the business and you're you're controlling this process and all of a sudden someone comes and says no this is this is the right result instead and if you don't understand the result and we can't explain it from the technical perspective, then there's really a big risk for lack of trust and that leads to rejection. So I think that's that's a crucial thing and also be, be very open with like the flaws that the model might have. And we identify these areas which, which the model isn't maybe excellent in capturing and this is how we try to mitigate it or this is how we're gonna try to mitigate it. So. I think that's super important because these, I mean, these are experts at what they do. So they, I mean, they truly understand um, what is needed. So it's it's very important to get their, also their feedback, I think, when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to developing the solution. Um, and also, I think one thing that it might sound simple, but just make sure that you speak the same language. Uh, there's, I mean, it's obviously quite technical, uh, some parts, but try to kind of explain it in, in a good way uh, so that it, it makes sense for everyone listening. Um, and then going into the second uh, like identified area, I think success criteria, meaning uh, having like clearly defined measurable targets with what we're developing is is super is super important um, because if we don't know how to measure something, how do we kind of know if it's if we succeeded or not? And if we don't know that, it's very difficult to kind of scale up and roll out the solution. So uh, we. Um, I mean, this is definitely something that we realized along the way. We thought we were agreeing on like an MVP or a minimum viable product. So like a, a first, uh, first product, like a, a simplified version of this. But then along the way, we actually saw that when we spoke about success criteria, we saw that maybe we aren't really aligned because uh, maybe the stakeholders expect 100% accurate demand forecasts, while that's not really... Uh, what we kind of set out in the in the MVP. So I think having those clearly defined early on so that we can capture those kind of uh, discrepancies between what we think we're developing and what they think they will be receiving uh, has been has been crucial for for our success at least. Um, and I think we can also park uh, like some features that they want in the future. We can we can park it and maybe say that this can be possibly added later on. But now we focus on this kind of MVP version to uh, really test and, and see if we have any value. Because yeah, otherwise you, you can spend the multiple years just adding, topping up different features to improve and improve and improve. But mm, yeah, I guess that sort of goes back to the big question of like, shortening time to market with, uh, let, let's say, like any type of innovation, that there's all, always this sort of forces that do you try to do it in a scalable and, and proper fashion so that you can actually put it out quickly or, or do you try to do something cheaply and, and then go fix, fix things later? 
so, so one thing is maybe just uh, have a bit of planning, uh, at least up front, so not just go head on to, to solving everything that you see up front. But uh, I guess there's also a lot, lot of other ways to, to, to shorten the time to market, I, I think, for, for Uda, Uda, Uda as well. Uh, well, you, you're sort of new entrant in the end. And, uh, and, and probably you're sort of uh, working against a lot of these big uh, uh, grocery uh, retail companies that have been there for a long. They have huge investment budgets and uh, uh, sometimes they already have pretty solid digital products and, and you need to sort of both tackle the way of like putting all the new stuff that you have in mind, like really quickly out to the market. But, but what's like the big big potential there for like shortening this uh, uh, these these time spans of yeah. time to market? I think when it comes to AI, you should also think about like what is a reasonable time to market for a specific initiative. Uh, because I I often I, I I get fully support to focus on like speed and efficiency and getting things out there. But I think that's primarily for the purpose of learning as much as possible in the shortest possible time to generate the most possible value in the end. As at least how how we try to look at it. And like when it comes to AI, if you like exclusively focus on getting quick wins and moving the needle on end user metrics, like month to month, as many cross-functional teams kind of have to do, then this may be lead to this uh, local optimum <laughs> that I spoke about in my introduction when it comes to like uh, uh, like uh, getting gains from AI. But I think like a lot of the potential in shortening time to market has to do with empowering data scientists with great tools as well. We haven't touched upon this yet, but just like being... Uh, if, if your data scientists are spending their time constantly fighting with environment, dependencies, containers, infrastructure, and basically anything that's not like data science or, or AI, then, then, I mean, you're living only on the table, I think. So I want, to, I want to highlight that as well, just take the opportunity to do that. Like any time that your data scientists are not spending on solving the actual end user problem, working on the actual app, is time that could be, uh, could be better spent. So I don't mean like get the shiniest, the newest and shiniest full-fledged data science platform, just empathizing and listening to the data scientists to understand, like taking a, not just taking a product perspective on the AI, but taking a product perspective on the AI tools and platform that you provide to the data scientists. Um, we have a team of three MLOps engineers at Ola to serve 27 data scientists. They're on, on average very happy <laughs> with the tools, at least according to our, mm -hmm. our research and surveys. So we're definitely trying to put our money where our mouths are. So just wanted to highlight that as well. I think that's important when it comes to shortening time to market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think at least what we've been seeing, I think HMM is also using this this term AI foundation. And I think increasing number of companies are sort of adopting this term to to mean all the different shared aspects uh, in, in scaling AI and, and putting it the, into a big organization. So that it's not, you know, it's not just individual people, individual teams in different parts of the organization building their own thing, and not really caring about others, but but really about like uh, for some AI foundation is about people and teams practices, pro development processes, idea assessment. It might be shared technical systems for testing, deployment, or, or production systems. Increasingly, sometimes it's also like shared libraries. So, so I think we've seen uh, at Salo, at our customers, we've actually seen a lot of recent cases where uh, companies are scaling beyond like individual AI teams. And then they're trying to figure out how do they get these individual teams to share their machine learning, modeling work, so that the logic is consistent uh, across these teams. And, and you need to optimize and fix things only once across all of them and then it comes to to all sorts of like feature stores or, or sort of uh, very specific uh, uh, details in, in the neural nets and, and so on uh, and, and, and that goes to the other sort of like really deep and technical uh, scalability factors for, for this AI foundation but but overall like if, if you're thinking about this uh, they sort of what are the, all the different ways you can do to scale from let's say a team of five into team of fifty or, or a team of five hundred 
in in building machine learning uh, into products like like what's what's the big thing you would sort of highlight <laughs> on? I mean, I could start. I think this is uh, this is really interesting, and let's see how many uh, how many conclusions I have here. But I think. I mean, I definitely agree that like uh, data is really important, and for us, we have a lot of data, and uh, it's it's a matter of understanding the data. And if we have a kind of domains owning this data, and and um, can we feature store that they that they own, it's much easier for new uh, use cases to start up and kind of utilize that instead of having like overlaps. And I think we've had a lot of like different teams inventing the wheel sort of, or doing the same uh, exploration again and again. Uh, and I've, I've done that too uh, in my product. So I think that's super important. And uh, I know that uh, we're, we're organ reorganizing a bit uh, internally just to make that even more um, kind of uh, accessible for everyone and, and uh, democratizing data, uh, you could say. So I think that's gonna be helping a lot when starting up new use cases to just uh, really be able to uh, to use the data really fast and not spending unnecessary time like overlapping work. Uh, I don't know what you think, Shettil, from your side. Yeah, fully, fully support that. Uh, and I can also add like uh, to answer the question, like what things like do I think like are the most obvious to have in an AI foundation? I would say like, first of all, a uh, skilled data scientist with very clearly defined roles and responsibilities. So stop with that like uh, data engineer data analyst data scientist chimera unicorn stuff and don't trick people into saying that they get to do cool machine learning when in when you hire for a role where it's basically just a data vending machine and then uh, where these people need to work closely very closely with other tech and business disciplines depending on the problem space and you also need i think an explicit focus on data exploration and experimentation that madeline also was alluding to this should inform like both the problems that you which problems to solve and how to solve them and this needs to be anchored in the company strategy and culture for learning by doing managing risks and rewards balancing short-term and long-term returns and also being comfortable with not knowing with uncertainty and ambiguity because that's where data science thrives and finally, like I, like I said earlier, like a philosophy for enabling and empowering data scientists end to end with great tools and infrastructure. I think like it depends on the company, but many companies I think can skip the whole AI project handover from data engineer to data analyst to data scientist to ML engineer to software engineer, <laughs> unless you're working in particularly complex domains that require a lot of specialized knowledge. But just by taking a product perspective on the data science platform and the data itself, so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That. That's what I yeah. Have. yeah. So, so maybe if we move a bit more to the Q and S, I, I think there's been quite a few already now uh, coming up, and uh, please do keep them coming. Uh, so, well, I think while you're at it, Chad, so so there was a question for you, but I, I think Madeline, you might also have some thoughts on scaling machine learning driven product to multiple markets. So, so supposedly. You need to do a bit of customization. Things don't exactly work. People don't exactly behave the same way in different markets. So, so what's what's the secret sauce? That would <laughs> I'm not sure there is. The, the which uh, sauce you 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 drizzle on top will probably depend a lot on the use case. Mm -hmm. But um, like to be, I haven't been involved in all of these cases, obviously. Um, but. Um, when it comes, like it's been on the case, like for example, we have our service time prediction model that predicts how long a delivery will take. That's input to the route planner. And like when we uh, launched in Finland, we started out with some really simple heuristics to estimate this. And then we just added a feature in the machine learning model saying which country that was predicting for. And it started learning this more or less by itself. Um, and whereas with some product recommendations thing, Things like where, for example, when we start launching in when we launch in Finland, we have different products. Everything's completely different on that side. How are the product recommendations? So the first question was like, can we bootstrap on our data? Can we do some sort of transfer learning? Uh, we ended up not doing that. Uh, I think we just made some really something really simple in the end. So um, yeah, those are the examples that I have, and it's kind of been handled like by the cross-functional teams, like the people that are close to the problem. And I think we solved it in quite. Yeah, in, in pretty good ways, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, I think for from my perspective, like you can't really customize for 77 markets, like even though you would want to, like it doesn't, we can't scale like that because it's going to take uh, forever. So I think we it's, it's kind of a matter of identifying the common sort of business requirements or, or business needs when it comes to how you can steer kind of the models that we, that we develop. So maybe we can, we can have parts of it being uh, adjustable so that you can set thresholds that would be different for different markets and you can uh, I mean one market might be more aggressive in in one aspect while another is less aggressive and then they can sort of work with their own strategy but not uh, like developing or customizing the the machine learning models too much of course it would be trained on on um, uh, country specific data but try to uh, like um, try to keep the same uh, solution as much as possible I think from from my perspective yeah yeah I totally agree this for, for us it's, it's sometimes even even thing that it's it's not just about putting AI into several different markets but but it's it's really like uh, for example when it comes to also like edge deployments or, or different different products that are cost really different parts of the portfolio they behave somewhat differently the data might be different but you would in in the end you really really want to try and have the least amount of models in in production and rather just try to push the customizable needs into the data and then have the model figure out the customization so basically it's simply because just running individual AI models in production, that's already quite a bit of work. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and it's sort of uh, the more you have them, the, well, the more you're going to be waking up. Uh, yeah, I can completely support that idea because one of the benefits of a good AI solution is that it should scale really well, right? So if you just start yeah. making different models for everything, you're not getting the benefits of that scaling. So I completely yeah. agree, it makes a ton of sense. And it, it could also like adding on to that, it could also be like you, uh, it's also opportunity to challenge a bit the way of working and why is it different? Like, does it need to be different? Maybe one market is doing something that is actually applicable for mm -hmm. on a global scale and they don't really have the forums to discuss this in a good way. So it could also be like sharing knowledge across or globally, which, which could also be like a, a win with, with rolling out this type of solution. Yeah, so really going back, like not not thinking about it as a technical problem, but thinking about it as a product problem. How how to, well, what sort of new new ideas can we figure out about that? Um, so briefly over here in between, so I think regarding uh, the la uh, one one of the questions we have here, there is also the poll on based on uh, the attendees experience, what do you believe to be the key enabler of building a strong AI foundation? And uh, overall, I think uh, our attendees has two specific uh, favorite answers. So, so the winner out of the five was the uh, answer of joint development practices. So I would assume that this is regarding uh, the development of new things, not so much about how, how do you, uh, in, in terms of technical sense, not so much about product practices or, or, or sort of running things in production practices, but really on AI development. And the other favorite was was actually a team with product mindset. So, so I think that that would go back to the, the question that I often have in, in software as well, that you do need to have active product management present in the daily work, you, you know, to keep the, the focus on, on what really matters, Madeline, and as, as you said, like, uh, don't get stuck in the technical questions if they don't really drive, drive the value for, for the end users. And uh, so, so regarding the five, three other un quest, uh, answer alternatives, so there's a bit of opinion of some common technical infrastructure and having a strong sort of a flagship leading project that, that you central on the focus to find success first. And uh, actually the, uh, uh, the alternative getting least responses was on having a team with strong technical expertise. So, so I suppose the, uh, you both should be quite happy with, with that. So, so really see the value in, in not just having a bunch of really strong technical people, but, but how much it actually matters for to, to have the product thinking 
backing backing it all up. That, that that answer is very contextual, uh, of course, right? Uh, so I take it like if you're it, it's it's if you're working with uh, self driving cars, you probably need more technical expertise than with product recommendations. So super contextual. I think like I my favorite of those uh, questions is the team with the product mindset. Uh, I believe I think like um, in like joint development practices is something that will help but I'm not certain if I would consider it the key enabler. I think the product mindset and maybe even like the flag, like having a flagship project because nothing nothing like gets by and like showing results, <laughs> right? So I, I think, I think uh, personally, I, I, I prefer those two, two alternatives. I don't know, what do you think, Melon? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I agree. Now I can't really see the options here, but... Um... But I, I definitely think like product mindset and I'm uh, like super proud of the team uh, we built. And I think everyone plays like a crucial role in really realizing uh, the, the goal that we, we set together. So I think that's kind of key that everyone in the team kind of is, is passionate about the problem that we're solving and, and the, business, uh, the business requirements. So I think... And it, it turns out that they, like most people actually enjoy understanding that too uh, and not just building uh, building something that they don't really see the value in. So so that's really been our kind of uh, mm. biggest or most important. Yeah, okay. Uh, still a few, a bit of time for, for a few questions that we had here. So, so picking a few, um, and then there was a bit, bit was a few questions on on the, let's say quality and reliability in a lot of different aspects actually one question was about this trustworthiness of ai and like how, how to convince people to trust the the, the outputs uh, another one was on, on data quality how, how do you deal with the situation of, of bad data and the third was actually on, on, on external data which is always a bit of interesting thing when you go and put AI into a product because in the end data is, is the thing that defines the logic. And, and at least we've, we've sometimes had these customers having good ideas of let's use external data. And, and but, but then sort of the interest towards that uh, goes down quite a bit when you ask actually place the question that who do we actually want to be responsible for the logic of your product? Is it, is it going to be you and your organization or, or some who knows who person in the internet whose data you are using? And, uh, that's often the challenge with machine learning and external data. But overall, this reliability, whether it's on the data side or the model side and, and, and the feature side, like uh, that, you, you know, user, user, uh, user uptake of features often relates to, to how reliable features are. So, so any, any special thoughts on that? I think, I think the issue of uh, trust is very uh, interesting. And, uh, and like, um, um, what is trust? <laughs> what, how do you build trust in your machine learning algorithm? Is it related to transparency? Maybe. <laughs> is it related to demonstrating that it just works? Is it related to just testing it and validating it really well so that you reduce the likelihood of messing up? I, we, we have a tendency to trust people, but that's because we're used to it. <laughs> it's much easier to fix broken algorithms than it is to fix broken people, <laughs> so to speak. So my perspective on this is that we actually need to challenge ourselves and our stakeholders and end users on this. What does it mean? We have some experiences in Odover. Like we tried to build like some, we build this autopilot uh, uh, POC, like autopilot for groceries. And then some people were like, no, I don't understand what's going on and the transparency and stuff. And then we just did another round of copywriting on the text that explains what's going on. And then suddenly it's much more well received, right? And then sometimes you have like a tendency to start trusting things that work. So as long as you trust it enough to use it, you start building trust over time because it works, right? I don't know. I don't know how a how a plane works, but I get on it and I trust the trust that it won't fall down. Although they occasionally do, I guess. But uh, that's my. I don't know. It's a bit a bit of an edgy take, I suppose. What do you think, uh, Madeline? Do you have something more uh, more more friendlier approach? <laughs> 
no, I, I mean, I think that that makes sense. And I think what you also mentioned with like proving the value is, of course, like how you build the most trust, right? You you actually show that it works. That's the most important. But I guess it's it's like a way leading up to when you can actually prove it, like you need to develop something first. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, I think transparency is definitely uh, key, but also you could try to, something we did is that like um, we had a demand forecast that wasn't maybe as accurate as uh, maybe the, the business users, like it didn't sound uh, as accurate as maybe they would want. And then we did a test to try to evaluate like how many because this demand forecast was used for a specific pur uh, purpose. So then we tried to see like how many kind of decisions from the, from the output of this would have changed if it was like 100% accurate or, or more accurate. And we could actually prove that very little changes would have been made to kind of the output from, from that model. So, so it's kind of just um, meeting them kind of halfway and, and uh, like, because if, of course there's, we understand their concerns, but it's just a matter of proving if, if, the, if we can get value from it. All right. Hey, thanks, thanks both. I think we're sadly running out of time. Uh, I think uh, I at least had a lot of other things to, to discuss here as well, but uh, that we have to leave for the next time. At least there's a good excuse for, for to have that then. Uh, but again, uh, so uh, for, for everyone listening in, thanks for you as well. So today we'll be hearing from three companies that are building AI into product R&D, designing AI as, as part of the next generation of products. So, so thanks to Marlene Moritz from uh, HMM, Shed Delando uh, Sevik from UDA, and, and also a big thanks to Mia Jokiluhta from Silo. So she's been here both preparing and setting up the webinar, running all the little details just to keep things running. So thanks everyone involved. So, so I hope it's, it's been fruitful, interesting, and uh, also it's educational and, uh, and uh, definitely do keep in touch uh, when, when there's new questions on that. So this is part of the, the overall SALO webinar series and, and uh, do, do stay posted on, on the next, next time we'll, we'll be online. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks, everyone.